Hey everyone, welcome to this exclusive master class presented by Stake Me to Play, Mastering the Mental Game Part 2. My name is Jared Tumbler, Mental Game Coach. In the last class, I gave an overall view of the mental game, describing all the areas of strength and weakness players generally have, areas such as tilt, fear, focus, decision making, the zone, etc. And I then had you begin kind of taking a closer look at your particular mental game seeing areas of strength and weakness. In today's class, we're going to now take the next step. Take all of the work that you've done and kind of gathering information about your mental game and begin to craft it into a strategy that will help you to manage these mental game issues in game. Now, these are, this is not a long-term solution for everyone. For some people it may be, but it will be one part of an overall strategy that I will give in future, future seminars. But in today's class, we're going to focus on developing a strategy for you to manage these mental game issues in game so they do not affect your play so that tilt doesn't turn into raging monkey tilt so that you know some minor doubts or fears don't turn into paralysis where your mind just shuts down and you can't think at the most important times such as being in a big pot and then I'm also going to begin to show you some of the big mental game pitfalls that players inevitably kind of fall into when, when they're trying to make mental game progress. Right, if you don't understand how to see mental game progress, then you're going to make some decisions that are going to actually hurt you, and there's a lot of players that have done that. So let's just jump right into this because there's a, there's a lot to talk about, uh, and I want to make sure that you guys kind of nailed this pretty well. Uh, this is a general strategy. As I said, it's, it's pretty adaptive because it applies to all mental game issues, um, but the personalization is something that I'm going to show you how to do uh, later on in the seminar. So you're going to kind of take this structure that I'm going to give you and you're going to then eventually begin personalizing it. Now the first step is recognition and, and I'm also going to go into all of these steps in more detail. All right, first step is recognition which is basically what you began doing by gathering up a lot of information about your particular mental game. Recognition is, another, you know, is, is very simply having the awareness to see in real time your mental game issues. Second step is a deep breath. This is not a kumbaya, you know, make you relax kind of thing. It's a very purposeful tool, and I'll explain more uh, in a bit. Step three is injecting logic. This is a technique behind thinking, in a sense, that helps you to use the, the mind, which is your primary muscle in correcting mental game weaknesses, uh, in a more efficient way. The fourth step is called the strategic reminder. Uh, as you've begun kind of grabbing hold of this mental game issue in real time, uh, you then want to get yourself refocused back on the action, and that's what the strategic reminder does. Uh, step five is repeat. <laughs> You're going to often be faced with uh, uh, the mental game issue popping back up repeatedly during the session, and so you're going to have to repeat those four steps. And the sixth step is quitting, because sometimes it is necessary. So let's get into the, uh, the specifics of this strategy. Um, just a little bit of background first. Uh, recognition is, is essential. Uh, you cannot solve a mental game problem such as tilt or fear in real time without having recognition. It's not enough to remember afterwards, like, oh yeah, uh, well, I was obviously on tilt because I did X, Y, or Z, like, and then you made all those mistakes. Um, it's not enough to, to know that afterwards. You need to know it at the time when it matters. It's just like making a poker mistake where you're like, oh yeah, I should have folded there. Well, why didn't you? It's not enough to just say that you should have done X. It's not enough to say you should have known that you were on tilt. What you're trying to do is figure out your pattern so that you can learn more about your mental game and be able to develop enough skill to see it in real time. As I say at the bottom here, recognition is a skill. You have developed uh, a skill set in poker to see profitable spots, let's say to three bet. Now, how do you have that vision? How do you have the ability to see that profitability. Well, you have developed it through a lot of skill, through a lot of training, through a lot of experience, through a lot of practice. And the mental game is no different. The ability to see that you're angry, that your, your frustration has risen to a point where it's now beginning to affect your play, is a skill. There's a, there's a, a level of knowledge and experience that comes with that. And that's what this step is all about. So you've begun to do that by taking the time to really study your mental game more, and now you're going to be doing it a lot more and really kind of honing uh, the power that you have to, to recognize 
uh, your mental game in real time. Now, let's just go through these, these first two things uh, again because I want to make sure they're very, very clear, right? In order to solve a mental game problem, you must be able to correct it in real time. Recognition is the weapon that you use to have that opportunity. If you can't recognize that you are beginning to tilt, then you will not be able to correct tilt based on this definition because you can't just quit, uh, solve tilt by quitting. Quitting is, a, is just a short-term strategy to protect yourself. It's not actually solving the problem. The problem gets solved in-game, just like you can't be a winning player if you only know the correct way to play afterwards. You have to be able to make decisions in the moment when it matters. And winning in the mental game is the same way. Now, in order to correct your mental game problem in real time, you must be able to see it happening before it becomes too severe. And that goes back to the performance stress curve, which I talked about in last class, uh, and which I will talk about uh, in a minute. Now, the reason is that uh, you must be able to stop it before, before it becomes too severe um, is because when emotions rise too high, or if your motivation or focus levels falls too low, uh, that shuts down higher brain function. Now, higher brain function is essentially your tool to correct your mental game problems and obviously to play well too. Okay, so the, the ability to recognize the early signs uh, that the, this mental game problem has emerged is so critical. Now, all emotions play the, by the same rule. That includes anger, fear, motivation, confidence, and we can kind of say that focus uh, is an emotion, although that's you know a bit of a misnomer, but the, the idea is that you need enough emotion to be properly focused, and so you can have too much focus and you can have too little. Plays by the same rules here. Okay. Now, thinking is the muscle of the mind. Now, if you have lost the ability to think because your emotions are too high or too low, then you're going to lose the opportunity to actually see or recognize uh, that your mental game problem has emerged, and you're going to lose the opportunity to do step three, uh, injecting logic, uh, to be able to kind of work your way back up. Now, the further you slip down either side of the performance stress curve, uh, the weaker your mind becomes. It's like the, the less energy you have, or the more energy you have, uh, the weaker your mind becomes to be able to be capable of recognizing and capable of correcting. So let's just kind of see how this plays out. So let's assume that uh, you're either tilted or you're beginning to lose focus. Now, recognition is the ability to see this, or ideally you want to be able to see it, you know, let's say you, you know, you're at the zone or, or close to it, you want to be able to spot that you have begun to slip down on either side very quickly. But what happens? For many players, they are not able to. And so their game begins to steadily slide, either becoming more frustrated as another beat happens, or becoming more unfocused and distracted the more they are focused on other things, such as Facebook or uh, you know, text messaging. And so their game continues to slide and it gets worse and worse. Anger rises, they become more bored and distracted and disinterested in poker. Now ideally what you're trying to do is grab hold of this early, but at any point in time you have the ability to grab hold of it and that's what you're trying to do. But if you grab hold of it when it falls too low and you try to kind of work your way back up from a very weakened point, right? it's going to take a long time for you to get back to the top. right? And you kind of have to think about it almost like you're, you're sort of traveling a certain distance. What happens is uh, the, the, the farther your mind falls, the longer it's going to take for you to, to, to recover unless you get lucky and you know, win a big hand or uh, get lucky and you, you know, all of a sudden become more challenged uh, because uh, you know, one, of the, one of your nemesis is going to sit across from you and now all of a sudden you're interested in, uh, in the game more. But that's, that's randomness. There's variance in that. You, know, you want to be in more control of your mental game. So being able to catch it early is huge because you don't want to have so much of a distance to travel uh, to get back and eventually be able to kind of work your way back up and that's uh, essentially the, the, st the strategy. So, so the recognition ideally is early, but, but when you have uh, recognized it, you know, even at, at say this point, um, you've got to understand that the way in which you're going to get back up to the top is steadily climbing up. It's not going to happen you know, just by going from, uh, from the very bottom 
uh, all the way back to the top. That is a fantasy, uh, unless you get lucky. So another way to think about recognition uh, is that it's basically like a series of road signs. And, and these road signs are alerting you of danger. You know, that, that this early sign of frustration, let's say it's, uh, you know, that you just sort of notice you begin playing a little bit faster uh, or you feel a little bit edgier, your, your, your hands on the computer, um, you know, you, let's say you're typing in bets a lot faster or, um, you know, you're playing live and you kind of just move your chips in faster. And you can just sort of sense that there's something beginning to build there. It's very early, but w w what you're trying to do is make a clear connection between that minor problem with the potential for it to be a major problem, like kind of the worst of the worst, because the pattern has some inevitability to it. There's almost like gravity to your issues, and the worst um, your mental game can get is basically wh what's, what's kind of sucking you down. And so you kind of have to be the force that fights up against uh, that pattern. Now, the, the recognition that you're even going down that trail is, is critical. Uh, so that you have the ability to turn it around quicker. So, so think about uh, these points of recognition like, like road signs. And I want to give you a couple examples. So w let's talk about tilt here. So let's say the first sign is some minor frustration and you experience that through uh, maybe your hands get a little bit tighter. Uh, maybe you start to have this impulse to, uh, to table talk or to write in chat or to berate some players. Um, and so that's how you can recognize you're, you're beginning to become frustrated. Now if things get worse, then you begin swearing. And if they get even worse, then you start forcing the action and just sort of raising any two, or maybe not that as serious as that, but you know, you're forcing action. You're, you're trying to push people off hands uh, that I, you know, logically you know are not, is not correct, uh, but in the moment it feels like that's what you need to do. And then of course when it gets really, really bad, but you just want your money back now and you will do anything uh, to get it back, including uh, re-raising in spots, going all in spots where you just know it's not profitable. Um, on the other side, let's look at, at folks. So it might start with some minor distraction where you know, all of a sudden you start paying attention to the table, to the TV in the casino, or or the table next to you, uh, or if you're playing online, you just kind of have this thought pop in your head about uh, something a friend was doing, and you want to check Facebook to see if they're doing, or uh, you get a text message or a phone call. You know, slightly distracted, not major, not going to destroy your game, but you're clearly not thinking as well as you could be, and there is some inevit inevitability to where this could lead if you don't stop it, uh, and it might then lead to you starting to become less interested in the game in general. You're not, you don't really care about putting people in ranges as much anymore, you don't really care what your opponent has, you're just kind of playing a more standard ABC style. And then if things get worse, yeah, maybe you start playing a little more creatively, kind of trying to like make it more interesting. So you start uh, rating the action, taking some higher variance lines, things like that, that in essence are you trying to wake yourself up, but <laughs> you're doing it because you're, you're so bored. Um, and you know, at its worst, you're basically completely autopiloting. So let's just look at these again, because the, the whole point is that you have uh, these, these very clear patterns. And so when you're at this level of minor frustration, you have to realize that the worst your mental game can, can get is basically the gravity of the issue. It's, it is what you are unconsciously competent about, meaning that, uh, from again, from the, from the previous uh, class, unconscious competence is the things that you've mastered, including your bad habits. And so the worst that your mental game can get is basically the area of your mental game that is mastered, meaning that there's a part of you deep within that will eventually want your money back now. When your mind is much sharper, as it is all the way up in here, right? everything above this, when your mind is sharper, you have the correction readily available to that mental game problem. You are consciously competent about the correction to wanting your money back now. But you have not mastered that correction yet. Okay? Only until you've mastered it will your game sort of reach a new bottom point, and this becomes no longer an option. And that means that you have truly solved a mental game problem. In the meantime, you are using the power of your mind, the knowledge that you have gained, to correct this. And you're fighting with, with, with everything you have, and I'm going to give you the rest of the strategy here too, uh, to correct it. But, but basically, um, just to look at this, um, this is the thing that is pulling your entire game down. And you've got to realize that uh, when you are experiencing just some minor frustration, everything here is basically inevitable if you do nothing to stop it. And the same is true uh, for your distractions. Okay, now a couple things to make very clear. Recognition does not equal control. Okay? Just because you can see the mental game pattern, just because you saw the road sign, 
doesn't mean you have the power to turn the car around. doesn't mean you have the power to stop the inevitability of uh, your pattern kind of taking hold of your game. Okay, that control is something that comes with experience, with knowledge, with training, uh, and also with the correction, which is where injecting logic comes in. Okay, recognition simply allows you to be able to take control. It gives you the ability to see your pattern in real time and take action. Uh, control comes mainly with a clear understanding of the cause of the problem. Now, you can't stop a problem you don't understand. You may be able to slow it down, but you won't be able to solve it, uh, or you won't be able to, uh, to correct it in real time. Okay, so I know I've belabored recognition quite a lot, but I did so because it's a very, very important piece, because nothing else can happen without it. So, deep breath. Now, a deep breath is really designed to be sort of like a, a mental step backwards, uh, to give you some space, I mean literally, it's like mental space, to be able to think a little bit clearly uh, so you can climb back up after recognizing that you've slipped a little bit. Now, you can think of this as the equivalent of like kind of leaving the room uh, when you're in a heated argument with like a friend or a significant other. You know, you're just kind of, kind of just battling and just kind of butting heads and, and nothing is really being resolved. You're unable to actually kind of get through to each other. And, uh, but, but sometimes that's, that's because both of you are just too frustrated. So you leave the room, kind of just kind of go try to cool off. And then level heads prevail, you come back and you're able to, to kind of talk through it. A deep breath is the equivalent of that, except it's not, it's not practical, especially for online players and even for live players, to have to like get up and leave the table every time uh, you have a mental game problem pop up. So a deep breath is sort of a way of doing it in, a, in just a simple way um, and give you enough mental space to be able to then uh, inject logic and use the remainder of the steps to kind of recover uh, your mental game. So basically you can use a deep breath uh, to increase or decrease uh, emotion, right? So depending on what side of the performance stress curve you're on, if you're trying to reduce emotion because you're tilted or you're trying to increase emotion uh, because you've lost focus or are a little bit bored, uh, you can have a different way of breathing to kind of give you a cue uh, to, to do either. So my suggestion is that when you're trying to cool down or reduce emotion, that you breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. And you, you know, it kind of has like this indication of cooling down as you're releasing that, uh, that air. The opposite would be breathing in through your nose and out through your nose. You know, when you breathe out through your nose, it doesn't necessarily have uh, uh, the same effect. You're not getting a almost like a full exhale in a sense. Uh, and so you can obviously use either um, for, for either purpose, but I think you sort of just sort of choose one. Um, and so what will happen is you create an association uh, that will grow, grow stronger. So when you are trying to relax, breathing out is your way to kind of indicate that. And when you're trying to fire yourself up, breathing out through your nose is your way of indicating that as well. Uh, if you want to make your breathing a little bit more effective, um, try to breathe into your stomach, um, not into your chest. So what that means, or, or a way to practice that would be to put your hand, uh, one hand on your chest uh, and one hand on your stomach. And what you're trying to do is breathe in through your nose and breathe to kind of blow your stomach up like a balloon. Uh, this is called diaphragmatic breathing. And it's slightly more effective than breathing in through your chest. And the reason is because uh, the alveoli, the, like the things in your lungs that are, are sort of receiving the oxygen, uh, are more dense uh, at the bottom of your, uh, of your lungs. And they're a little bit more sparse uh, in your chest. So what will happen is if you breathe in through your mouth, you know, it goes like straight into your chest. It's almost like a shot of adrenaline, which, you know, in some cases is a, uh, like a physiological response that helps the brain to know that there's some kind of danger. So when you're breathing in through your nose and deep into your stomach, it has sort of that, that calming, soothing effect. Um, but again, uh, if you're breathing in through your nose, deep into your stomach, you can still create um, uh, more energy uh, by using it uh, more as a cue, kind of mentally, uh, to get yourself fired up. Okay, so keeping this in mind, right, the deep breath is something that can be done uh, in as little as five seconds, right, and without being noticed by anybody else. I mean, the key in poker is not to give away a lot of information, especially if you're playing live. And so if you can take a deep breath, you know, in five seconds, that's really all it takes. Maybe you take two, so it takes 10 seconds. 
um, and and you're just doing it to very to, to just like focus on your breath and give yourself that mental uh, mental step back uh, so you can do step three. It can be done very easily uh, without actually having to to leave your computer. Now, if uh, you've fallen kind of far down your curve on either side, uh, you might actually need to step away from the computer and take a couple minute break. Now, that's sort of the worst sort of case scenario, or I mean, obviously quitting would be the worst case scenario, but in this case where you're still able to manage it, taking a small break is your opportunity to see if you can come back and actually recover. But again, the idea is the same, whether it's a deep breath or whether it's actually walking away from the table, the idea is to give you a break, give you a mental step backwards uh, so you can go on to step three. And for those of you who are familiar with um, my technique from the first book uh, of Injecting Logic, uh, the, the technique has actually been expanded to include goals and inspiration, so I just want to make sure the heading is clear from the beginning. Basically, you are fighting against a, a hardwired pattern. As I said, there's like a, a, a trajectory to this pattern. There's a momentum and an, ine an inevitability uh, to it. And so the, 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 the technique of injecting logic, goals, or inspiration uh, basically builds off of what people naturally tend to do when they're struggling, which is to talk yourself through it. You have thoughts trying to motivate you to, to focus, motivate you to calm down. Uh, and that's basically what injecting logic is. Um, but the way that it becomes a technique, and more than just something that people naturally do, is that you're actually trying to correct the underlying cause of the problem. So it's not just about saying anything to yourself. It's about saying something very specific that will correct the underlying problem. Now, that's hard. You need to really understand kind of the roots of your mental game problem, and that's something that I'll do in future talks. But for right now, we're just trying to create something that is better than what you normally talk to yourself. So because it's, it's sort of it is, is like pre-planned, you can think of like the best things that you've ever thought to yourself uh, in those situations, excuse me, in those situations. Uh, you can also talk with other players to come up with statements uh, that will help you to recover your mental game. Here are some examples. Uh, tilt. Let's say you tilted because you made a mistake. You could say something like, mistakes are going to happen. The bigger mistake is letting one turn into more. You know, and the basic idea is that mistakes are going to happen because it's impossible to always know everything. Uh, if you knew everything, there would really be no purpose for learning. Um, and so you're just trying to uh, keep the snowball effect to a minimum. Fear. Real failure, and let's say this is a fear of failure. Uh, real failure only happens when I give up. Uh, keep fighting to play great. And so, again, that's something that you do after taking that deep breath, after recognizing some anxiety has come up, you take a deep breath and, and, and have that thought or say it out loud as a way of kind of pushing you uh, back up the curve. Procrastination. Today is when improvement happens. Tomorrow is a fantasy. Uh, and just to give you some background on, on that, um, procrastinators think that tomorrow is a fantasy because tomorrow never comes. <laughs> you just keep delaying things until tomorrow. But when tomorrow becomes today, well then they're just so good at delaying things to tomorrow that it just gets delayed again until either there's a deadline uh, or there's just no more opportunity. It, the opportunity is just gone. Um, so today is when, 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 when improvement happens and so that statement is designed to get you a little refocused and a little bit more motivated. Uh, boredom. Um, I haven't mastered poker. Uh, finding some, find something that I can focus on improving. And boredom basically means you've lost interest and so this is kind of trying to direct your mind uh, to find something of interest uh, so you can get back playing well again. Low confidence. Um, a lot of players who lose confidence think their game disappears. It's like they, they just are lost in what they do well. Uh, but the reality is that my game can't disappear that quickly. It's not possible to lose unconscious competence and all the other things that you've learned can't possibly have gone away that quickly. So my game can't disappear that quickly. What's one part of my game that I know is strong? Giving you something to kind of hold on to and begin recovering your confidence. On the other side, overconfidence. When your head gets in the clouds uh, or you get a little too jacked up and start starting to think that you can beat anybody, um, I always have weaknesses in my game. What's one part of my game I know needs work? So you can see that the, the overconfidence and the underconfidence 
um, the strategy is very similar. In one case, we're trying to remember what you're good at. In the other case, we're trying to remember what you're bad at uh, so that you can m maintain some perspective. Um, here are just a couple guidelines for uh, creating your injecting logic statements. Uh, the first one is that emotions are never the problem. Okay, emotions are the symptom. So if you're angry, you know you don't want to say, "Don't get so angry." Uh, let's say you're angry over bad beats. Don't get so angry. You know, bad beats are a part of poker. Well, the first half of that statement is 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 factually false, um, or I should say, is just not really helpful. Um, anger, the anger over bad beats is happening for a reason. Your job is to understand why. So yes, bad beats are a part of poker, but maybe there's a part of you that doesn't want a bad beat to be part of poker. You want things to be fair. And so that would be what you're trying to use in your injecting logic statement. It's more about a connection to fairness, something like, um, I need bad beats to happen because that's how I end up getting rewarded. Otherwise, poker becomes chess. So that would be, uh, you know, and I say by chess, meaning not as profitable. Like profitability in poker comes because uh, bad beats are a big part of it. It what allows uh, other players to think that they're good. So there's there's a, a, a need for bad beats, um, but what you're trying to do is create uh, the correction to the the feeling of unfairness. For example, that bad beats are happening to you. So it's not about the emotion. It's about uh, why the emotion is present and that's a big part of it. The why is the key. So if you're trying to figure out an injecting logic statement and you're kind of stuck with the well uh, you know the fear or the loss of confidence or the anger is the problem um, ask yourself some why questions like why is this bothering me? What's, what is the, the, the issue that I have with a bad beat with, that I have when I make a mistake? Um, and once you start to understand that a little bit more uh, then you can start to think about corrections uh, to that problem. Um, also, a try to avoid <laughs> using these words. And I say try because this is not as essential as, as the first thing I mentioned about emotions. Uh, but try to use stronger words, you know, such as I will. Uh, and, and also try not to use negative words. Uh, you know, you want to be somewhat directive uh, in, in your language and not so negative uh, in, in the correction here. Now, um, as I said earlier, the, the technique has expanded over the years uh, to include goals and inspiration. So for example, if you've lost focus, you've lost motivation, sometimes even when you lose some confidence, um, you can use your goals as a tool to help you climb back up. And so having them you know, kind of close by uh, becomes a real asset to you. Um, the, the, the ability to re remember why it is that it's so important for you to be in control of your chill problem in real time uh, can be helpful. Why it is so important for you to be focused in real time uh, can be important because your actions that you're taking at the poker table are very much connected to your goals. Um, now, the key thing uh, in using injecting logic is that you don't want to rely on your memory. right? As we've already talked about, your mind is somewhat malfunctioning. It's not working as properly because you've lost some of that emotion um, uh, or, or some of that ideal emotion and either have too much or too little. So when your mind is malfunctioning, you don't want to rely on your memory to have to remember uh, what to say or to have the potency to kind of get through that emotion, break through it, and help you to recover it. So I suggest using some multimedia. Now that can include uh, pictures, video, uh, audio recordings. So you, know, so you can have a, a picture uh, with your statement. Uh, you can do some video. Uh, it might be something off of YouTube that helps your, you to remember uh, what's going on, or you can create a video for yourself. You can do audio recordings for yourself. Uh, you know, a very simple thing would be just to write it down on a, on a note card, a sticky note, stick it in your phone on a notepad. Um, you know, and again, other things you can use would be, you know, music would be some ins for some inspiration. Uh, you can write notes on a, on the back of a card protector. Uh, you can use a family keepsake as a reminder. You know, there's a lot of things that you're trying to, uh, that, you, that you can use uh, as a tool to just kind of break through that emotion. I think that's, that's really the essence of injecting logic um, or goals or inspiration is trying to get you to break through that emotion. So you have the emotional reaction, right, in which you are recognizing. You have the deep breath, which is helping you to take a step back and create separation from that reaction. And then you have injecting logic, goals or inspiration, which is helping to stabilize your mind first 
and then help you to kind of break through it uh, so you can climb back higher. And as I said, uh, anything that will give you a reminder uh, and help you break through the emotion is really what you're after here. Okay, now this step is going to fail for some very predictable reasons and it's important that you recognize this so that it becomes an easier thing for you to correct. Um, number one, let's say you're trying to inject logic uh, and it's not working. And the first thing you want to see is whether or not your level of emotion was just too far below. As I said, you know, you want to catch it early, but in the early stages of correcting this problem, it, you may have to almost, you may, you may be only catching it uh, once it's at the very bottom or close to it. So if your emotions are too great, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for your mind to be strong enough. You may be able to think about the interesting logic data. You may you know, hear the audio recording, but it doesn't have an impact on it. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for the injecting log statement to have an impact by either reducing or increasing your emotion. If that doesn't happen, uh, there may actually be too much of it or too little of it uh, for it to have an effect. Uh, the next one would be that something new threw you off. Not uncommon. When you're learning more about your mental game, there are going to be aspects uh, of, your, of, of this pattern they're going to be new to you. You know, it's, it's like a lot of uncovering going on. These things are not brand new. You're not creating a problem. What you're doing is creating new awareness of, of things that, are, that currently exist. And so in the process of doing that, uh, you know, you may kind of just miss a sign because you didn't know that it connected with uh, your tilt problem, for example. So try not to get too critical of yourself. If you've been making progress with tilt, for example, and all of a sudden you take a step back because you just didn't even see it and you just kind of blew up. Well, look for something new. Look for those signs again and really be, be pretty critical um, of what happened uh, so you can really understand how to make it better the next time around. Uh, next thing could, could be that your statement just wasn't strong enough uh, and it needs some work to help uh, you know, make it stronger. And again, I'll talk more about that in future uh, uh, seminars, but in the meantime, the idea is try to understand more about why. The deeper you can kind of get into the roots of the issue, the easier it will be for you to create uh, a stronger statement. Um, you are more aware, uh, but not aware enough to be in control. Meaning, just like the injecting logic statement itself, you know, has a degree of strength to it based on how much you've learned it. Your degree of awareness may not be strong enough yet for you to kind of take action. You may sort of like kind of passively be seeing what's going on, almost like you're on a train and just sort of like the scenery is going by. It's almost like like you you sense that you're tilting, but you just either can't or don't yet want to be able to take control of it. And, and that want to sounds, sounds a little bit crazy, but sometimes at the very bottom of a player's mental game is this feeling of hopelessness, like that there is nothing that they can do to control their mental game or even their, their game in general, and they feel like, like, why try? And so in the early stages of correcting their tilt problem, you know, they may not yes, necessarily have enough kind of potency to that recognition. Uh, to be able to take action. Uh, accumulated emotion. This is a huge, huge issue. So, so let's say uh, you you're begun to run bad and you've been working your ass off to contain your tilt problem. You know, tilt connected to bad beats, mistakes, um, you know, feelings of unfairness uh, have been, been, been contained pretty well. But what's been happening is that steadily every day, just like a little bit of that emotion has been building up. And so on day four, all of a sudden, you know, the first bad beat and you just, you just snap. It, you just lose it. So, you know, you go straight from the top of your curve uh, all the way to the bottom. And it's because that accumulated emotion was kind of hiding. Now, that's, you know, a, a, an example of something that's sort of more... Uh, you know, kind of close in time, meaning that the, the running bad is, is pretty clear. It's been happening over four days. Sometimes for some players, the accumulated emotion has been happening for years, and it actually dates back to things personally. So, the, you know, their procrastination problem started in school, and now 10 years later, here they are uh, still struggling. And so all of a sudden, you know, they've been super motivated for, you know, many, many days, but then all of a sudden, uh, you know, one small misstep, and then all of a sudden, uh, they're just on the couch all day long, uh, you know, not even wanting to play poker. Uh, that accumulated emotion uh, is a big, big wild card in this and something that you have to be aware of because it, it really can destroy progress. It can destroy your perception uh, that you've taken you know, a major step backwards and that this strategy is failing. Um, this strategy has been tested. I mean, it's, it didn't... Um, it, 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 has, it has its roots in, in traditional therapy. I mean, I've learned it during, it during my master's program. 
Uh, it's been well researched. Uh, in addition to uh, the fact that it's helped you know thousands of players from around the world. So this strategy works, but there are things that are going to limit its its ability to work. And accumulation accumulated emotion uh, is a big one. So keep an eye out for those instances where the emotion just comes on so strong uh, that you're unable to really fight against it, uh, and it happens immediately. Uh, in that case, you want to really start to look at the origins of that accumulation. When did it start? Did it start before poker? Did it start in the early days of poker? Um, and, and begin looking at uh, you know, perhaps why it uh, has accumulated as well. Uh, and then the last thing is you might need to use multimedia. You know, Sometimes just kind of thinking to yourself, using a note card, uh, it may just not be enough. You, need, you know, you're really just looking for something that has that potency, has the ability to just break through uh, the emotion uh, and get you making progress. Okay. Now, all of that is all well and good, but none of it necessarily makes you better at poker in real time, which is really what what this is all about. You know, it's one thing to stop the problem from happening, but it's another thing to get yourself back playing poker well. And that's where the strategic reminder comes in. And this step is all about poker strategy. It has nothing to do with the mental game other than the fact that uh, your mental game is what has caused you to need it. So your mind is malfunctioning. You know, you're struggling just to, to, to reduce the, your, your anger uh, and, and get refocused. And now you don't want to just say, okay, now go back to playing well. You want to give your mind specific things to look at so that it has something to attach to and that often becomes a way for players to climb back. You know, an easy way to, 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 to reduce tilt is to play well and start making some money and, and, and winning hands. Now, you don't always have that choice uh, if the variance continues to go bad, but if you're at least playing well, uh, then uh, it, it will be almost some protection against uh, the tilt uh, continuing to go bad. So here's how you create the strategic reminder. Uh, you can either make a list of only what goes missing from your thought process when making a decision or you can make a list of all of the factors that you consider when making a poker decision. The basic idea is just think about how you make poker decisions. You know, are, do you make them somewhat random, uh, or are they somewhat, uh, you know, linear in, in in effect? Meaning that, you know, are you thinking about, you know, factors sort of somewhat randomly or or in a in a tailored way to the hand, uh, or do you have a specific thought process that you go through in making every single poker decision? You know, you're either in one of those two camps or, or a combination of it. Um, if you're in more of that like a random uh, category, my suggestion is uh, that you make a list of only what goes missing. So for example, if you forget to put people on ranges or you forget to, to consider prior action uh, when you're, you've begun to tilt, then as part of your strategic reminder, you're going to make it known to think about those factors. So basically what you're doing is you're recognizing tilt has happened, you take a couple deep breaths, uh, you inject your logic, and then you know, with your injecting logic statement, uh, you're then adding in a strategic reminder to get you back refocused on specific things that will help you to play well. And you can actually write this stuff down uh, next to your injecting logic statement uh, so that everything is pretty close. Now, if you're uh, somebody who kind of thinks in a more linear, sort of step-by-step -step fashion, uh, my suggestion is you make a list of all the things that you do um, and you just make sure that you go through that process well. And if there's one specific step that tends to go away the most, then you really are emphasizing that step. Uh, but the suggestion is that you, you kind of go through it, uh, the entire thing, and just really uh, make the entire decision-making process a little bit more mechanical rather than, than spontaneous, because if you just go on what naturally is happening at that time, uh, you're likely to make another mistake. So again, write it on a note card, put it on your phone, do whatever you can. Your mind is not functioning properly, so do not rely on your memory. Okay, repeat these steps. Now, it is so important that you understand the repetition that is needed to actually make some real headway uh, with uh, your ability to correct uh, your mental game problem. Um, it, it's not a simple solution. Um, so you've really got to study. You've really got to be prepared uh, to take this kind of action. If you are, then you've got a real shot at being profitable, in a sense, mentally, just like you are profitable when you've done a lot of study and work to see those profitable spots. Um, and the main reason that you have to be like really prepared is that when the mental game problem has shown up, uh, you've begun to tilt, 
you're you're very likely going to have to be battling this thing throughout the remainder of your session. It, it, you know, there are cases, and, and it's going to be you know more rare. Let's say like you know 10 to 15 percent of the time, you know, you're going to be able to inject logic, and you'll never have to do it again for the rest of the session of the tournament. You know, the, the game kind of gets back. You know, kind of get into a rhythm. Um, and, and perhaps even are running well and, and winning a bit, um, and you won't have to keep doing it. Most cases, you're going to have to continue to go through this cycle, and it's it's a bit like a fly that just freaking won't leave you alone. You know, you just keep swatting it away, and it just keeps coming back. You swat it away, it keeps coming back. And, and your ability to stay kind of uh, committed to the strategy and not get frustrated that you have to keep fighting uh, is really critical. Uh, because you're just going to need to keep um, going through those steps. Um, being able to uh, be focused uh, on continuing to correct this is, is critical also because it's likely that the issue is accumulating. So every time you fight away and break through some of the emotion, it doesn't mean you break through all of it. So little bits might accumulate um, you know, as, as you keep repeating the strategy. So being aware of that accumulation um, might help you to become more vigilant uh, in continuing to fight against it, and also to do the opposite of what mo most players do, which is, you know, when when they are able to inject logic and, and go through the strategic reminder, and they're back playing well, they kind of get into a rhythm. They almost feel like like the problem is gone, when in actuality, if they've done that several times, the problem is getting worse. So at the time when they need to be more vigilant, they're actually relaxed. So again, the key point here is that be aware that the problem can keep accumulating and you've got to be real vigilant and aggressive uh, in being able to, to counteract it. What you may do is after, let's say, five times of injecting logic, that may be your cue to actually leave the table and come back five or ten minutes later. Uh, at that point, you're probably at greater risk. I mean, you're hypothetically at greater risk. You know, Identify it for yourself. Uh, you're at greater risk for that accumulation really impacting you. And so you're going to preempt it, take a bigger break, uh, and come back after you've had a little bit more of an opportunity to have that accumulation decrease a little bit. Um, sometimes if injecting logic is not working in the moment, uh, you can be somewhat spontaneous in the moment. I, there's been a number of instances where I've had clients, and even myself, uh, thought of something in the moment that became a really strong injecting logic statement. Um, so what you can do is to ask yourself in the moment, for example, like, why are you pissed or why are you bored? And you might have an answer. And, you know, or you might say, like, like, what do I need to get myself back playing well? Like, what do I need to break through this anger? What do I need to get, to, to get myself interested in the game in, uh, uh, again? And sometimes you might have, have an answer that uh, can turn in not, not only to an injected logic statement you can use at that time, but also something you can use uh, more regularly, so you'd write it down and add it to your strategy. Um, again, another adjustment is to take more deep breaths or to take a longer break, as I suggested. Okay, uh, quitting. Quitting is a skill. <laughs> it's a, it, and it should be some, something that is somewhat strategic. Okay, and the strategy in my mind is um, that you keep playing well as long as you can remain somewhat, not obviously perfectly, that you can remain in control and avoid playing your C game. If you are playing at your worst, it's it's almost like like you're just repeating bad habits on top of losing a ton of money. So not only are you making your game worse right now, but because you're getting better at your worst, you're making it more likely to happen uh, and show up in the future. So in my mind, as long as you can make some improvement, and that improvement is enough to justify whatever potential risk you may be or whatever decrease in win rate you may have. Again, there's a, the strategy, the skill to to the decision of when you quit based on you know how much your game has degraded relative to the game of the edge that exists in, or, or your edge that exists in the game. It's a decision you have to make. But the idea is that as long as you can make some improvements, then from a, a learning standpoint, from a correcting your mental game standpoint, there is value to you being there because you're avoiding uh, your worst. And and if you do that over time, th eventually that worst will no longer become an option. Your game will truly kind of take a step forward from the back. You will suck less when you're at your worst and you've reduced the inevitability uh, of your pattern. You've kind of chopped off uh, a part of your, your mental C game. Um, but if you're only quitting, um, you know, if, if you quit at like the first sign of tilt, 
uh, you never really give yourself the opportunity to really correct the problem in real time and you'll never actually really solve the problem. So um, I, I strongly suggest that all of you really think about quitting as a tool. Now if you're a tournament player it's a different deal but if, as a cash game player or certainly you know online tournament players who have the options of, of uh, you know playing in more tournaments during the day I really advise that you have a, a, a well thought out strategy for when you quit and when you keep fighting and and sometimes it's going to come down to um, kind of understanding your limitations in the moment uh, being really aware that you know you don't think that you can keep fighting anymore you're tired it's at the end of the session now you're tilting all of a sudden you just you don't have enough energy left to fight so that's probably a good time to quit or if it's earlier on you know and you're really motivated because you want to correct this problem and you're just in there fighting and you realize that you're not playing perfectly but you also realize that you're not playing terribly and you can see that you're making progress then you just keep fighting and you and you kind of delay quitting as long as you possibly can uh, and that's and that's a strategy but it, Either way, really uh, work hard to, to develop a clear strategy for quitting. Okay, now let's assume that these six steps or the four steps repeated regularly uh, are working. Sometimes they're going to work in ways uh, that you don't even realize. So I've actually jumped here. Um, recognizing progress. Recognizing progress uh, is, I think, one of the most critical things uh, that players miss. It's so hard to spot mental game progress sometimes, um, you know, and they end up like abandoning a strategy that actually is working, uh, but because they don't see that progress, they just quit the strategy. They quit what they were doing. Um, on the flip side of that, <laughs> sometimes they think the strategy has worked so well they don't actually need it anymore, and that's where the overconfidence comes in. It's the overconfidence with the level of success that that strategy has provided. Now. I promise that this, these six steps or four steps, they work, minus the limitations I've suggested, but they are not, in and of itself, a long-term solution for your tilt problem, for your boredom problem. That will only happen when you've actually resolved the problem at its core, or you've corrected, in essence, the bad habit or the flaws that exist in unconscious competence. Once that hap has happened, then you no longer have that reaction to tilt or you no longer have that reaction uh, to be bored. And at that point, you have truly solved the problem. But in the meantime, getting there is so freaking hard sometimes. Sometimes it could take three months. Sometimes it could take a year, depending on how severe it is. Sometimes you might feel like you have corrected your problem playing you know, 200 NL, but then you move up to 2-4, to, uh, to, to, to and all of a sudden now uh, the problem has kind of popped back up. And, and you can you know, be a little bit overconfident that uh, the problem is solved forever. Or you could switch and start be, start playing PLO or tournaments uh, and, and have uh, that tilt problem pop back up. That is really common. Okay, so the, the key thing is whether or not you are, uh, you know, kind of making progress within your existing games uh, or whether or not you're going to, you know, go play another game, you have to really understand that correcting mental game problems is much like learning poker. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. If it did, you'd be really skeptical about how long it was going to last. But some players really want it to happen overnight. So when they see immediate improvement, they believe, because they want to believe, that it means more than it actually does. And that is a really risky uh, like kind of situation to be in. So my, my advice here is to just give yourself a little bit of time. Um, give yourself a little bit uh, uh, a chance to... Uh, uh, gain some experience um, and, and avoid kind of prematurely thinking that you're farther along uh, than you actually are. Now, going back to, to recognizing progress, um, increased recognition, the ability to see your mental game problem in real time or potentially even afterwards is always the first sign of progress. So if you had done the work from the prior class and you came to today with a much richer understanding of your mental game, even though it's still a problem, and may, in, in some cases, may have even gotten worse, didn't actually get worse. Your awareness or your perception of it got worse because you're now actually seeing what's going on before you were just blind. Now you can see, and now you can see all the problems. So it may feel like it's worse, even though it actually is not. But that increased recognition is always the first sign of progress, because without it, you can't then go through the steps to correct it. 
Okay, other ways that you can see mental game progress. And again, just to, to keep in mind um, so that you can keep your strategy going. Emotions still feel as intense, right? The initial reaction to how angry you get still, still feels very intense, but your, your poker mistakes aren't as bad. You're still able to think a little bit more clearly. Um, you're able to, to, to kind of grab hold and recognize that emotion you know, quicker. Um, there are things that are happening besides just that feeling, because sometimes the feeling is, is really subjective in the moment. Like, it's hard to compare uh, you know, how you feel with your anger today to a month ago, uh, unless you really create a, 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 a very in, a detailed description, which is hard to do. It's hard to compare just the, the pure feeling. And sometimes, because you have been more focused on your anger, that greater focus, greater awareness of your anger actually amplifies the experience of it. So you feel angrier just because you've been focused more on your, on your anger or tilt problem. But you're not playing as bad. So, so that's a big sign of progress. Another one is right, you're able to see the pattern better in real time um, even though you can't stop it. So that's again the greater recognition. You recognize earlier signs. So going back to that performance stress curve, before you could only see when you were, let's say, you know, at level 70 out of 100, uh, but now you can recognize, you know, like the, the just the very early kind of flicker of anger uh, from from a bad beat or from a mistake of yours, and then you can recognize, uh, and and so that recognition is is a huge sign of progress. Uh, you can actually play better longer. You're able to to kind of keep um, uh, uh, that that strategy of of, of um, of not quitting, uh, of going through the repetition of those four steps many, many times, uh, is allowing you to play longer and play better longer. It's not just about <laughs> uh, you know playing monster sessions, uh, blowing off a ton of money. It's actually about continuing to play a solid game uh, and keep your mental game uh, in check longer. Uh, the urge to spew decreases, right? So the the, the severity of your tactical mistakes uh, has decreased as well. Uh, you're able to recognize a new mental game problem. Sometimes clients come to me and and they're like kind of a, a little annoyed. They feel like they've been making making some progress, and and they're kind of upset and they're describing what's going on. I'm like, okay, so what you're saying is is that the tilt problem is better, uh, but you still have you know this uh, this problem where you're you're just doubting your decisions in these spots, and it takes a little bit of time, but <laughs> you know convincing them that that actually is progress uh, is a big uh, motivator for them uh, because they see that that what we've been doing that the strategy has been working that their tilt problem is no longer as severe and because it's no longer as severe their mind has been able to recognize another mental game issue that has been there all the time but it just wasn't dominating their perception and so they didn't see it now with that that tilt problem decreasing this mental game this other mental game issue pops up why because you always have mental game weaknesses just as everybody else does. Decreased intensity of emotion. Probably should have put this one last because it's generally the last thing that improves. Right? That initial charge uh, of intensity of, uh, of anger or, or doubt or, uh, or loss of confidence that you get is generally the last thing to improve. Your recognition, your ability to control it and contain it uh, is the first thing, but the ability for that initial charge to decrease means that you are actually really learning it to unconscious competence. And that's, that's a big, big, big step. And the last one here is a faster re recovery after quitting. Some players are just like, just destroyed after they get done playing, especially a, a session, let's say it was, it was a lot of tilt. They're still pissed off for the rest of the day. Uh, it affects their life, it affects their relationships, it affects their desire to want to go out. Uh, and that, that really kind of dominates their life. Uh, it could be, you know, f a feeling of, of like just being really down about your game, and then you're down the rest of the day. But you know that you're making some solid progress when you can decrease the amount of time that it takes for you to feel feel normal again. Um, and if it can go from, let's say, you know, a day or two days to one day or to five hours or to two hours or to a half hour, you know, that's when you really are going to start to see. Uh, that the solution is getting in there and you're really resolving the problem. Um, okay, so uh, a couple other uh, common pitfalls to progress. Uh, failing to track progress. As I said, it's, it's really important for you to be able to see 
that you're making improvements in your mental game. But if you don't have data, like there's not a hold a manager for the mental game. So you have to be the one that's kind of tracking to see exactly what's improving. So at the end of your sessions, you can ask yourself some questions. You know, did I, was I better able to control my tilt? Yes or no? If yes, in what ways were you? If no, why not? What you know? What can you do to improve the recognition? Improve the strategy? Um, you know, and I say keep a paper trail because if you are just um, keeping this in your head, uh, then it's really really hard um, to remember to remember everything. You know, a paper trail. Uh, allows you to kind of look back on um, on your own mental game, create a per a perspective that can help you to see uh, improvement that has been made. Um, many players uh, that I coach keep a journal, keep a record uh, daily of, of of issues that they're experiencing, uh, of descriptions of their mental game for that day, even when things are going well. Um, and what it allows them to do is to, to see how their language changes. You know, you can see sometimes a decreased intensity and in tilt based on how you're talking or writing about it. So you don't have to like, keep a written journal, you can also keep an audio journal. Now if you can, you can sort of sense the intensity of your anger going down over time, even though the feeling hasn't changed, then you know that something's actually improving. You know, because the way that your, your language has changed about it. You're getting better at managing it, you're getting better at, at dealing with it. Um, and lastly, assuming that progress should happen faster. Progress in the mental game is very much like uh, progress in poker. And, and just because you know what is wrong uh, does not automatically mean that you know how to correct it and how to be able to, to do what's right. right? You're often, they're often looking for big changes um, and not acknowledging the small ones. And the small ones are critical because they're very often going to be the things that are going to indicate to you that things are improving. And if you don't see them uh, and you miss that, uh, then you're going to be in, in a much weaker place uh, to want to keep motivated uh, and keep yourself going. Uh, so that is all that I have for today. Um, I hope that this has been helpful. Uh, once again, you know the, the strategy will work uh, if you put the time and effort into it. Uh, I'm not saying it is an instant cure. I'm not saying that it will um, solve all of the issue. Uh, that's obviously for more work um, and, and future classes. Um, but it will work if you put the time and effort into it. Uh, so with that, I wish you all very well and I look forward to talking to you again.